Hello, I'm Justin Perkins. This is Talk Junkie. When I was a kid, my little cousin, you know, he was quite a few years younger than me. Um, he uh, always wanted a, a weed eater or a push mower. He always wanted to cut the grass. I never wanted to cut the grass. It was like a chore. I didn't enjoy it. Later on in high school, um, my dad would set up a couple family members' yards and one or two other yards, and he would go with me and my brother, and we would cut them, and and we'd make money that way. Uh, And I'd done that a little bit as a moneymaker for a while, on and off as a teenager, and uh, right out of high school. I never enjoyed doing it, but it was a way to make money. A lot of kids do that, you know. A lot of people have to do it at home because it's a responsibility. My dad never made me cut the grass at his house, ever. My mom never made me cut the grass at her house. I cut grass for my grandfather. He was all for it. My mom just, I don't really think, um, they were, she was kind of particular about her yard, and I definitely wasn't the, the best uh uh, landscaper. Uh, my dad just never really made us do it. Um, and I hated it. I always hated it. And when I first got married to my wife and, and we, you know, moved into our place, we were out there with my grandfather and my grandfather had always been like, you know, you need, you need to cut your grass. You need to cut your grass. And I'm like, man, I hate that. You know, I'd even try to work extra hours so I could pay somebody when we made very little money to cut my grass, which my grandfather thought was absurd. And he was like, eventually, you know, you'll take pride in that, you know, because it's yours. And other people told me that. My my grandfather never said it in those exact words, but other people told me in those exact words, eventually, you'll take pride in that, and it'll be, you know, it's yours, and it's a sense of accomplishment. And I looked at people who who cut their grass, and, like, they really got into it, and, and it meant something to them. I had an uncle who was very meticulous um, and before him and my aunt got divorced, you know, his yard was always perfect, and he was, he, he, he seemed to genuinely enjoy it. I would always go every year and buy new things, you know, rakes, and I would buy weed eaters when I didn't need them, and push mowers when I didn't need them, and I never took care of them. They, they would get ragged out and beat up, and I'd have to buy new stuff the next year, and the first two or three times I cut grass at my house every year, it looked really good and I really took my time and I really got into it and by the third or fourth time I was just like oh let me work some extra hours and pay somebody to do this we moved into a a bigger home a nicer home and had a bigger yard and I bought a riding mower and you know a new weed eater and I was gonna this time I was gonna be the sole landscaper I was gonna take care of that I wasn't gonna pay anybody I was gonna take care of this yard and I was gonna make it right I started out with that intention, and it lasted maybe three, four times, maybe three weeks, something like that, three cuts. And I quickly realized, okay, the riding mower is good. I can listen to music. Let me pay somebody to come do the little bit of push mowing there is and do the weed And so that's what I continued to do the entirety of time that I lived there. And I would look at my neighbors, and, man, they took so much pride, and they put so much work into into doing this that I was I was jealous and I felt like there was something wrong with me and I was actually sitting outside one day and one of my neighbors a friend of mine walked over and and I don't really remember what brought up the conversation but but we started talking about cutting grass and I I was like man to be honest with you like it's embarrassing but I I don't I don't want to cut my grass I just, I don't, I can't find a way to make myself care. And my friend laughed and he said, man, I don't give a crap if it goes sky high. It means nothing to me. It will be the last priority on my list at all times. I'm probably not going to do it. And I was like, really? And, and he said, yeah. He said, I've always felt that way. I, I despise the practice. He said, why do it? Think about the time you waste, you know? Think think about the lack of love there is in that that action you know and I'd thought those things but I'd never said them 
out loud, not because there was anything wrong with saying them out loud, but, but to me, I guess, in a way, I was almost afraid there was something wrong with what people would think about me, because, see, I wasn't living up to the status quo, I wasn't, I wasn't doing my diligent duty, I, I wasn't being a man, I wasn't being a husband and a father and a homeowner, and, and, and I wasn't being any of those things. And, you know, you look at the world around us, and unless there is, I don't know, I mean, an established home or a business, unless there's something where humans exist, there are no grass yards. There's no well-maintained areas. You know, my great-grandmother had a dirt yard that she swept. I guess the chickens kept it pecked down for the most part, and she swept it down, and I was told it was hard like concrete. And, and you know, that was, that was the environment in which they, they lived in. You know, that was, that was the, the, the model of a, a well-maintained yard in their time. But in that time, there's no way you could have convinced men to take time out of the necessity, out of the day, and, and take time away from a necessity to do something like maintain a yard and cut grass. You know, if you had that kind of extra room, let the chickens run on it and pick it clean, let the livestock feed off of it, grow a, a garden there, you know, leave it as, as a wooded area so that you could hunt it. There were so many more benefits to property than a yard, than a well-maintained, manicured yard. They look good. They're appealing. They're appealing because we're conditioned for them to be appealing. It's not like it's a master plan. No, it's, it's just over time, the more you see something, the more something becomes normalized, the more appealing it becomes. Occasionally, the abnormal is is idolized or is is desired and maybe that was the case maybe this beautiful manicured lawn was was the oddity of its time until it become normalized and when it become normalized it become the standard and when something becomes the standard then it is expected there is no no questioning in it it's what is it's what society sees fit now I still don't like to cut grass Work didn't work out the way it was supposed to, and after almost 20 years of busting butt and working hard to live the dream and get that house and get that yard, I lost it. Lost it in a bankruptcy. And yesterday, I was sitting on a hillside on a piece of property again that wasn't mine, cutting weeds because they were high, and that's what I was supposed to do. Now those beautiful patches of wildflowers growing in the weeds on this bank, and if that was, if it was purely up to me, and, and it's a complicated situation, but if it was purely up to me, that would grow head high, and I would plant wildflowers everywhere, and that would never be cut because it's so steep you can't even walk on it. But it's something that's required to be cut. It's something that's desired to look uniform and conformed and and standardized. I left the little patches of wildflowers. They were low enough to the ground, and I cut all around them and in between them and got out what weeds I could. Then I laid to waste the rest of the, the weeds. And I sat down to take a break. And if I hadn't been cutting weeds, I may not have been doing anything. I may have been working on my book. I may have been watching a documentary. I may have been playing with my son. I may have been messing around with my base. I may have been sitting on the porch. I may have been walking. I may have been thinking. Thinking. It seems like an utter waste of time and a useless endeavor, but it happens to be my favorite. I could have been doing any of those things instead of cutting grass. And I felt robbed. I felt imprisoned. I felt trapped. I felt like I'm giving in again. I'm conforming again. The difference is, I don't care to say it now, the difference is, even though temporarily this may be an issue, temporarily I may have to do this, that I'm not afraid to admit that I don't think it's right. I don't think it should be done. 
And I know that sounds so ridiculous. What, what great thing is it to rebel against the grass-cutting industry or against the, the notion that everyone needs to cut grass and have a well-maintained yard? Because it's, it's challenging. It's challenging the perception of what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be conformed. You're supposed to grow up. You're supposed to take one of the myriad of acceptable social uniforms that are provided. You're supposed to chase the money. You're supposed to chase the job. You're supposed to worry about being employed. You're supposed to worry about advancing in your career. You're supposed to worry about material things. You're supposed to worry about your nicely maintained yard. You're supposed to worry about the age of your vehicle and how new it is. You're supposed to worry about all these things. And it's a continual trap. I fall in it and I fall in it and I fall in it and I fall in it. But a couple years ago, something broke in me. Something changed. And then when I got laid off for the first time in 20 years, something really gave. And my perception changed. And, and how I looked at things got altered. And it's never really went back. Now, when I was sitting on that hillside holding that weed or my head down, for a moment I felt a slip. I felt a slip back into that rut. Back into that just exist. Day to day just exist. Now, there's, there's another rut. There's another rut that's just as dangerous and just as easy to get into. And sometimes it's, it's more enslaving because... You find it generally after years of being in the, in the rut of conforming. You find this, well, I've got to live every minute of every day. I've got to live it to its fullest. I've got to adventure and see and travel and be and do and, and all these great things. And nothing can just be average and nothing can just be common and nothing can just be simple. Everything must be grand and adventurous. I can't walk the mountain behind my house. I've walked it before. I have to go walk the highest mountain. See, I, I, can't, I can't look out at the view from off my front porch because I've seen it a thousand times. I have to go see the grandest view. That was the rut that followed when I got out of the conformity rut. Then it was do everything to the extreme. And the problem with both of those ruts is a lot of times it leads you living for tomorrow leads back to the same place. If you're in that rut of just work, head down, battle through life, you're going to make it to retirement. You're going to make it to vacation. You're going to make it to these days, these few, very few days that make the multitude of crap bearable. And then you get out of that and you get into the, the grandiose world of adventure and living for the moment and the reality is you don't really have the finances or the time or the ability. So, you're going to keep playing the game and you're going to stay in the rut but you're going to dream and you're going to fantasize about the grand things and you're never going to get there they're going to get almost there you can almost touch them you can almost see them you can almost feel them and then they're snatched away and taken back and you're back into the rut and then you look and say you never changed you never got out of that rut you never left the day-to-day -day monotony. You never left the grind. You never left the machine. You never woke up from the simulation. Someone just hit play on a different background, on a different soundtrack. It was just a variable. It was just a different, a, a different branch off of the same tree. You're still living for something that isn't physically there. But there's another possibility. It's called acceptance. You can accept the situation is what it is. You're stuck in where you're stuck. And you have to do what you have to do for the moment in time. But there's the ability. There's the ability to get out. It's not always fun. Man, about bankruptcy and debt and losing a lot of things that, that mean as much to you as you thought they did. It may require not having things that you realize you didn't need. But trading those things for things that you 
We really want. It still requires work. There's no escaping that. I haven't found a way. They say, follow your passion and do what you're passionate about. Well, I write. And I podcast. But I'm not good enough or I'm not passionate enough or for whatever reason, those two things don't pay the bills. I don't even try to monetize the the podcast at this point because I don't like the setup with the provider I'm with and that is what it is. There's always an excuse, but the point is, I still have to work and I have to work extremely hard and it took 20 years to get to where I'm at. And I appreciate that time. I do. And right now, things aren't the best. Layoffs are everywhere. I'm not working currently. But we are also in a, a situation we've never been in as a country. But I'm making sacrifices, but I'm getting things back. It's not my dream job, but it affords me some travel. It also provides a fairly good income that I can use to travel outside of work. And if it goes away tomorrow, I'm no longer indebted on everything like I was before. A lot of things are simpler. A lot of things are different. But a lot of things are better. Maybe it's one foot in the rut and one foot out right now. Either way, I like the view better. And one thing I know for sure, at the end of the day, I still don't want to cut grass. conform to that level I never could and it seems to some people probably like the most trivial idiotic ridiculous thing I know one person that I know for sure will understand it he and I have talked about it many times but that means a lot to me that they couldn't break me to that level because I've been broken I've been turned into a far leftist. I've been turned into a conservative. I've been turned into a a 90-hour-a-week, money-hungry workaholic. I've been turned into a lot of things on certain levels, but they could never completely break me. And again, you may laugh and go, why? Because you're too lazy to cut grass? No. No. Especially in my younger years. You'll find people that may use a lot of words to describe me, but lazy would not have been one of them. Hyperactive. I would get something stuck in my head and work at it every free minute of the day. If I had back the drive that I used to have, wow, it'd be dangerous what I could do. No, not because I'm lazy. It's because I don't like the way it tastes being told that even though this is a pointless endeavor and you can see that it's pointless and you can feel that it's pointless and you know that it's pointless society expects it of you they demand it of you if you let your grass get too high you're a bad husband you're a bad father you're not a responsible person you're lazy it's dangerous and 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 it's, it doesn't look good, and it's bad for the neighbors, and there's always an excuse for you to conform. I just can't do it. Somebody said it was a midlife crisis. But let me, let me assure you, to anybody that actually knows me, I've been a stubborn a- all my life. So... Maybe midlife just helps perpetuate it. I don't know. All I know is one of these days somebody's going to find some commodity old man sitting on a porch ink pen and paper in hand writing cussing griping, complaining smiling, laughing joking all at once 
with grass head high and paint war on the side of his house and vehicle rusted out. You're going to find the happiest, most contrarian human being they ever seen. And I hope that that'll be me. And I hope when I'm 70 that if no one ever listens to this episode and no one ever pays any attention to anything else I do, I hope that I can check in on Brando and his grass is still head high and he still just don't give a shit. I'm not saying it's right for everybody. And I always thought something was wrong with me. But it took a long time to see that that's not the case. That floods over into other things like not being willing to accept either party. Not thinking that one is better than the other. A lot of things that other people just don't agree with me on. Either way. I feel good about me. My book is almost done. I'm at the point that I will receive a couple just kind of test copies for me to look at, hopefully in the next couple weeks. I wanted to uh, to read the first poem out of that book today, but I didn't bring anything with me, and I don't remember it verbatim top of my head but the name of the book is um, Creating the Perfect Slave it's kind of self-explanatory I don't know but I'll, I'll, I'll be doing a, a podcast on the book as soon as it's done um, I no longer have any social media whatsoever so this podcast is only going to change, get bigger, get different, be anything other than what it is right now with help from people that listen to it. If it doesn't mean anything to you personally, I understand that. If it's just a fun thing you do, hey, I've got tons of them that way. It's not a big deal. You're not wrong for that. But if you really like it and you, and, and you really want to help, share it. Share it on social media. Share it to your friends. Tell people about it. Tell strangers about it. I don't care. Do whatever you can do to help get out the word, especially on iTunes and YouTube. Um, yeah, I'm having some trouble with YouTube, and I can't monitor numbers and things like that, but that's okay. It's not about numbers to me. It's about taking this thing a step further than it is right now. So if you can, share it. Comment say stuff, get back to me. There is an email just for the show now. It's talkjunkie at gmail.com. So email me. Let's let's get this things going. Remember the shows that are coming up that are going to be more interactive shows, especially the mailbag show. Send in anything you want. Um, Red Spotted Newt in Hazard, Kentucky. R-E-A-D Red Spotted Newt. It's the only place you can get my books locally. If they still have any, I guess I need to check with them on that. Um, and they are doing online orders right now. When my new book comes out, it will be the only place you will be able to get it for a certain amount of time. However long that'll be, I don't know. But support your local businesses. I can't name every business. There's a place called the Fork and Spoon, I believe, uh, in or Fork and Table. I can't remember. Wonderful couple of people that are trained jiu-jitsu with run it. I haven't had a chance myself to get over that way. I'm not trying to be you know, a hypocrite and say go support these people. I, I just haven't had a chance to get over there. I know they're amazing people. I know they do a good job. I've heard nothing but great things about the food. We are going to go check it out first chance we get. You know, uh, we're Everybody's in a, in a unique situation right now. So if you're in that area, go check that out. Check out Red Spot and Nude online. It's, it's a great uh, a great bookstore. And it's owned by great people. Check it out. Um, Roundabout Music, Whitesburg, Kentucky. Check it out. If, if if you've got a tattoo artist that does other art outside of tattoo, check out their pages. You know, i got to imagine it's got to be hard for them right now. 
You know, I don't know what we're going to lose once this thing's over. I, I really don't. Um, you know, I, I just, I, I hope that people can hang in there. But, you know, I worry. But be good to each other. Don't suck. Don't die. Like, subscribe, share. And I, I guess we need to do a, a quote, even though I don't have what I want with me here. Uh, hold on one second. I don't know if I've ever used this one. If I haven't, I should have, and I probably will again. The individual has always had to struggle to keep from being overwhelmed by the tribe. That was Nietzsche. Be different.